Well, good morning, church. Good morning to those of you that are with us online. You know, we believe today that what God the Holy Spirit wants to do is transform us. We believe that every Sunday, that there's a supernatural work that God does when we yield ourselves, when we surrender a part of who we are. We surrender maybe some things that we've been hanging on to, some ways that we've been approaching life, and we leave it in the hands of the Lord. We take what the Scripture reveals to us as truth, what the Scripture reveals as God's heart and His mind, We believe that God can transform us when we yield and we allow God to do what he wants to already do in our midst. And so this morning as we continue our series called Just Like Jesus, what we've been journeying on together is trying to figure out how do we not just like Jesus, you know, we just like thumbs up, not that we would just like him, but that we would become like him as God works in us. And so today we're going to continue this conversation and we're going to go to perhaps what is maybe the most Uh, fundamental teaching that Jesus ever gave. It is maybe understood to be the central point of his entire ministry. Uh, It's maybe the most often referenced, maybe most well memorized, perhaps with the exception of John 3.16. I think we probably all know that even better than this text. But the goal here is that God would renew our minds with understanding something about how God has wired us to love one another. And, And you've heard this before, right? The greatest commandment Jesus ever gave, to love one another. But then in John, 1 John 4, 19, where he says that we are able to love because God has first loved us. And so as we understand this and we see what God is doing in our midst, how it can absolutely revolutionize ourselves in our day-to-day lives and circumstances. So grab your Bibles. Let's go to the Gospel of Mark chapter 12. Gospel of Mark chapter 12. And so um, for context here, uh, as you've probably figured out as we've been teaching through the life of Jesus lately, that there's a lot of points where we get in some friction, some conflict. The Pharisees, particularly uh, a very passionate group of Jewish believers, that they were just frankly uncomfortable with Jesus, and they didn't like what he was teaching. And so uh, we find here again in this passage another time when uh, they, they have a, a series of conversations with biblical scholars and teachers of the law They were uncomfortable with Christ and his message, so they came with a few, you know, kind of tricks. They were throwing some traps for him. They were hoping they could get him uh, to say something that they could say, ah, ah, there he is, unbiblical, or say something that was frankly illegal in the Roman context. The Roman uh, government could get him in trouble, and so they they were trying to trap Jesus in his words, and their approach simply betrays they already had a preconceived bias about Jesus Christ that he was someone unbiblical, that he was someone against the will of God, that he was, in fact, the enemy of God. And they were simply trying to prove their preconceived bias about him. I'd ask you to hang on to that thought. We're going to need it a little later on this morning. Let's look at it in Mark chapter 12, uh, beginning in verse 13. It says that later they sent some Pharisees and Herodians to Jesus to catch him in his words. Now press pause here for just a second. You may not know the historical connection here, but this is a really interesting set, uh, an odd relationship of Pharisees and Herodians. Let me give you just a real quick context of this. Okay, so the Pharisees, you would actually think of them a a lot like us. They're very passionate, biblically-minded believers, Jewish believers. They were very into personal holiness. They were into fulfilling the law of God. Uh, They were really fired up about the Lord. And as as that sect of Judaism was, they also had a profound, profound hatred for the Roman government that was oppressing the people of Israel in their minds. They they saw the Roman government as taking God's rightful nation of Israel and usurping authority over it. So they they despised the Pharisees out of, uh, you know, among all the Jewish believers, they, they profoundly despised Rome. But you ever heard that phrase that the uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to botch this, Brian. It's the, if the, uh, the enemy of the, my enemy is my friend. Is that the way you say it? Thank you for the thumbs up. You ever heard that phrase before? Right? So uh, because the Jewish believers, they hated Rome so much, but they, they hated Jesus even more, they looped in the Herodians. Well, the Herodians, you probably never heard of these guys before. These were a group of Jewish believers who thought it was okay to pair up with Rome. The Herods, they were, they were politically supportive of the Roman government. So the Pharisees paired up with their political enemy because Jesus Christ represented such a, more, such a much more profound enemy to them. 
So they sent the, they paired up and they sent them to Jesus to catch him in his words. They came to him and they said, teacher, they're buttering him up here. We know you're a man of integrity. You aren't swayed by men because you pay no attention to who they are, but you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. Now, friends, they didn't believe this. They wouldn't be doing that. They wouldn't be trying to trap him if they believed he was, in fact, teaching the way of God. But they're, what they're trying to do is lull his defenses. Like they're, he's thinking, oh, you guys have come around finally, right? And then they're going to spring the question on him that's going to get him in trouble with either the Pharisees or the Heronians, either going to get him in trouble with the believers or get him in trouble with the law. They said, is it right that we should pay taxes to Caesar or not? Should we pay them or shouldn't we? I think April 15th is coming up. You want to know the answer to this question, don't you? But Jesus knew their hypocrisy. Why are you trying to trap me, he asked. Bring me a denarius. Let me look at it. And they brought him the coin, and he, and he, and he looks at it, and he asks him, Who's, whose portrait is this? Whose inscription? Who's on the front of the coin? Well, Caesar's, they replied. And then Jesus said to them, so then give to Caesar what is Caesar's, and give to God's what is God's. And they were amazed at him. He just wiggled right through their trap. Now, we said... I, open this passage with you. This isn't the really core text we're looking at, but I open this passage so you get the context. They are on edge with Jesus, and he's wiggling his way through their little profoundly set traps to get to truth. But I also want you to hang on to his specific answer about Caesar. We're going to need that a little later on too. All right, let's get to the real text, why we're in this passage. Skip down to verse 28. We're skipping over another one of those little angled things. They were getting snarky with him about the resurrection and so forth. We'll skip past that. Verse 28. One of the teachers of the law came and they heard and, and heard them debating. And noticing that Jesus had given a good answer, that he had wiggled his way through this, this teacher of the law asked him, of all the commandments, which is the most important? Verse 29. The most important one answered Jesus is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. The second, in other words, the second greatest command is this, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. Verse 32, the man reflects, he says, well said, teacher, you are right in saying that God is one and there's none other but him. To love him with all your heart and all your understanding and all your strength and to love your neighbor as yourself is more important than all the burnt offerings and sacrifices. And when Jesus uh, saw that he had answered him wisely, he said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. And from that point on, no one dared ask him any other questions. Now we've We've taught this passage we just looked at many, many times here at Christian Fellowship Church. You've been around any Christian church, you hear this all the time. It is maybe one of the most central teachings of Jesus, right? And we've explained it, we've unpacked it, but perhaps for the benefit of some newcomers today, if you'd let me just take a moment uh, to, to reframe or, uh, the theological stage that we know so well for this. Okay, so Jesus is being, he's being, they're trying to trap him, remember? But maybe this question is a little bit more sincere. This particular teacher says, you know, I've seen the answer to these questions pretty well. Let me ask another one. But the point is, they're trying to go after Jesus. What is, in fact, most important? And so Jesus answers instinctively, reflexively, precisely as any good, biblically grounded Jew would. He answers and he quotes the most central text of the Torah. Deuteronomy chapter 6, uh, where it says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one, and you are to love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, your strength. Now this is the most critical, it's the most unique, it's the most important revelation God had given. In fact, it's the foundation for the entire law of God that's going to be revealed through Moses, the Ten Commandments, and on through the other 600-some commands that, that God is going to give uh, Moses and the people of Israel. It is the foundation, it's the starting point. What's so profoundly important about it is that in, in the context of human history, this is the first time that God has been described as a God of love, a God of relationship. That's what God's been trying to reveal through the people of Israel ever since, ever since the beginning, really, and in and, and, and calling Abraham and his family, the people of Israel. It's this whole word picture God's trying to create of a relationship with humankind. 
But all throughout human history at this point, human religions had taught of gods who were at odds with human beings, who were at irreconcilable odds with humans, and these painful sacrifices had to be made to assuage the anger of the gods. That's that's where the human world, the human mindset was about religion and spirituality, is that God is up there, some entity up there, really mad at us, we got to sacrifice, do all these things to please him. You might even mistakenly think even that that's what the Old Testament, the Old Covenant uh, portrayed, was this angry God that we had to assuage with our sacrifices. But the foundational revelation of Deuteronomy 6 that every Jew memorized was this. Hear, O Israel, there's only one God. And the thing he wants from you is to love him with all of your heart, your soul, your mind, and your strength. And then when Jesus adds the second, in Matthew, Matthew's uh, version of this, he says the second commandment is just like the first. Love your neighbor as yourself. That one he's not bringing from the most well-memorized Jewish text. He's bringing it from a more obscure list of of, of, uh, moral codes, ethical codes in in Leviticus chapter 19. A whole long list that dealt with farming practices and how many seeds to plant and what kind of animals to do. It dealt with handling uh, disabled folks in your community. It dealt, you know, this long list about holding grudges and so forth. And in the midst of that, this little obscure phrase about not holding a grudge with your brother. And he says, love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus reaches into that obscure list of commands and says, that's the foundation of any ethics that we have. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. He brings the two together, and this is the grand revelation God has been trying to impose on humankind forever. All right, now, you've heard this before, right? This is not new teaching. If you've been around this church any length of time, Brian, Will, myself, um, we've all been teaching this um, in in many, many different ways in, in recent months and years. But this morning... What I think the Lord wants to do in this whole series, we've been doing this, just like Jesus, being like him, I think he wants to peel us into another layer and to ask the Holy Spirit to, to reveal to us, are there some inner truths that we need to face about what it looks like for you and I to actually live this out profoundly? Now, this next, next line of thinking, I need to give some credit here. I was li- ris- listening recently to a teaching, uh, the pastor who uh, pastors the campus church at my alma mater, a good friend, uh, Steve Deneff, he, he, he laid out a line of thinking in a talk I was r- listening to recently, and it really helped me catalyze what I think, what I've been seeing and feeling has been happening in the church. Look at, just take the last couple of years or so in our world, our country, in us as a people, okay? So we were already a profoundly divided and angry society, right? You know, politics is at a fevered pitch, and you just think, just go over the last 12, 18 months, there was a lot going on in our culture, you know, we had the incidents with George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, others that this uh, it really brought to the forefront very, very important conversations about racial equality and ethics and law enforcement. In January and February of last year, so just a little over a year ago, we were in the midst of impeaching a president, and so there were uh, questions about the balance of constitutional power and about integrity of national executives. These are all really substantive issues, right? And they're frankly worthy of you having an opinion. They're worthy of you paying attention to it, right? And so we were already on edge as a culture. These circumstances that had us kind of maybe, I mean, they've always been divided, but I mean, it was getting pretty intense, right? You remember that? You feel that? Uh, And there was something about California burning, and then uh, Kobe Bryant died, and all that kind of got lost, right? All this stuff going on. There's a lot of intensity in our culture. And then the pandemic hits. And we are driven immediately into isolation and fear. Literally, I was afraid if I went to the grocery store and walked past you, I would breathe and die. And then you would get all the toilet paper. <laughs> we had to start wearing masks. And I don't, know if, I don't know if you saw this for me. Like, when you're wearing a mask, I have a hard time making eye contact with you. I don't know what it is. I just, I don't look at you. Maybe I'm just looking at your Georgia thing on your mask. It's just so, you know, I, I don't know what it is. I, 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 you know, it's this sense of isolation where the, the normal facial expressions of empathy and connectivity and all those things were devoid of human emotion in our interactions. And out of fear, we're driven into a context where the only people we're hanging out with, unmasked, And face-to-face are the people who are most like us, that we trust the most, and we like being around. Brian used to call it your quarantine, the people that you're going to quarantine with, right? And it's a small circle of people who think like you, who act like you, who you trust, and those are the only people we've been interacting with in in a substantive face-to-face way. Am I right? 
And it's gone on for a year. And then, maybe more importantly, our entire connection to the outside world was driven online. And friends, is it no, no secret to us that social media is no place for the complex, detailed conversations, the difficult, nuanced conversations that differences demand? Did you catch that? We live our lives, we've lived our entire life for the last year connecting with the outside world through an internet where we're able to fire off commentary without consequence. And what I mean by that is, when you think about some of the things that we say or think or wish we could say, some, some of you are more disciplined on, on social media, and so you don't say it, but you th think there and say, well, if I, if I did reply, here's what I would say. And, there are, and it's, it's said in a way that you would never say face to face because the accountability of the human reaction, right? If I'm really rude to you, to your face, you're, you're, you're going to bristle and you're going to put a mirror up and just show me that I was kind of a jerk. And so social norms, we, we behave more politely face to face than we do electronically. We also judge and see what's going on in other people's lives, uh, you know, when it's in the social media context, you know, we're seeing it and judging it in, in terms of these little simplistic snapshots. You see a post of somebody you don't really like and how beautiful their life is right now. And you think, oh, how wonderful, and, and you feel this, but you don't know the complexity of what's really going on, right? And so the result, the outcome has been the absolute, complete polarization of nearly every single person along just about every kind of line imaginable. Your position on X determines how you are viewed, how you're respected, how you're welcomed into relationship. And you can, guys, you can apply this any direction. This isn't just about, you know, political views or cultural views. I mean, this can get applied into all kinds of relationships. Your coworker, your boss, your friend, your extended family, your ex, how you're viewing all, all this, the list goes on and on and on. But as a society, we've moved into this space where, where in short, we simply cannot and frankly do not love our neighbor in any kind of substantive way, at least the way that Jesus modeled and taught. I've seen this in the church. We're part of a small group on Sunday nights, and there's about eight families in that group. And happen to know about half of them could care less about what's going on in the world, and about the other half are like, they're like wound up about it. And of the four families that are really wound up about it, two of them are uh, wound up on the progressive side, and two are wound up on the conservative side. It's been really fun to watch this, because um, I know what's going on behind the scenes. And just one comment about how they felt about what happened in circumstance X, and people are like clicking out of Zoom. They're gone. I'm out. It's just where our world has gotten. But do you really want to live like Jesus Christ? If we really want to, we need to look at the Jesus call for something entirely different. Go to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. And again, I know this is, this is, there's nothing new here. This is all context, teachings, uh, words of Jesus we've gone over many, many times before. But I think the Holy Spirit today wants to do something uh, in repentance and a few of us and me and us. And uh, There's some really cool stuff I think God wants to do. Matthew 5, verse 38. Jesus says, you've heard it said that an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If someone strikes you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. If someone wants to sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. If someone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Give to the one who asks you and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. Now press pause there. Jesus, in this context, he's speaking of a very specific set of very real issues that Jewish people in Palestine were encountering at the hands of the Romans. 
Roman military and law enforcement officials, they were consistently wielding unjust power. They were compelling service, excessive, arbitrary force. Uh, tax collectors were, were ripping people off. And so when Jesus says this phrase, you know, if someone wants to sue you and take your tunic, it, there's very high likelihood that people are connect. Oh, wait a minute. He's talking about the tax collectors leveraging legal action against me to take my stuff. You've heard, you know, Brian talked about this recently, um, the, the tax collectors, and, and Levi was one of those, and uh, what they were all about. So, they're, they're, he's speaking of this very specific angst they have. In verse 41, when he says, if someone forces you to go one mile, go with him too. That was literally a law in the Roman uh, context that a Roman law enforcement officer, you know, carrying his heavy gear and so forth, could see you and say, hey, carry my gear. And you were compelled by law to carry his stuff for a mile. Or, you know, whatever the metric was. They didn't use miles back then, but, you know, that, that metric has been translated for us. And you were compelled by law to do it. And Jesus says, you know what? The officer tells you to go a mile. That's what you're required to do. Just keep walking. Get to the end of that. And he's like, okay, you, you fulfilled your duty. You can, no, 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 I got you. I got you. I'm, I'm going I'm to go with you a little further. And, and you, this idea of being compelled unfairly, unjustly, this, this evil oppressor forcing you to do something I don't want to do. And you know what? I tell you what, I'm actually just going to go twice as far for you. Be happy to carry it for you. You see that mindset? Something completely different. Now, I need to press pause here again. I keep saying press pause. That's my little tick today. I keep saying it. But you need to catch this. If you are in an abusive relationship, okay, this, is, this passage often, I've had folks that have been in, in physically abusive relationships, one-to-one -one relationships, um, and, and people, they say, well, am I supposed to, I'm getting hit by this person at home, am I supposed to keep doing it? That's a very, very different context, Okay. So just understand that. We can talk about that sidebar. would love to process that with you, Pastor Fred. Others here, I know we'd love to walk with you in that journey if that's your personal story. Okay, so don't, don't misunderstand this as Jesus calling us to live in one-to-one -one abusive relationships in the home and so forth. That's a whole different context here. What Jesus is talking about is the broader mindset you and I, and particularly because we know he's, he's, he's triggering on things the Romans were doing. He is tr it, it, this is where you and I get spun up when we are being treated unfairly, when things are unjust. And, and we're talking the big picture here. Jesus is talking about your attitude, your heart. Go the extra mile. Turn the other cheek. Right? He goes on in verse 43. And he really, friends, brings this home for you and me. This is, where this, this is where this becomes a challenge for us to think differently, to allow the Holy Spirit to renew our minds so God the Holy Spirit can do a work in us and reframe how we think and view our world. Verse 43, you've heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemies. That love your neighbor is in the Bible, the hate your enemies part is not. But that was how they were practicing it. Love your neighbor, hate your enemy. But I tell you, verse 44, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. He causes the sun to rise on evil and on the good. He sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. In other words, God gives good and bad to both. Verse 46, but if you love those who love you, that's no big deal. What reward do you get? Even... Um, you know, are not even the tax collectors doing that? If you greet only your brothers, are you not doing more, are you doing anything more than others? Don't even pagans do that, right? So in other words, he's saying, look, it, it, this love one another, love your neighbor, does, it, this is not challenging around the people we enjoy being around the most. He's talking here about loving those who will be most difficult, those, catch this, those with whom we have differences so great that we can consider them our enemy. And you may, not, you may not often use that word. You probably don't use that word. But when you think about loving people that your differences are so great that you've got nothing else but to, to, to oppose them, to fight against them. To love people, those who purposely view us as enemies and seek ill against us. Those who take advantage of us and cause us harm. See, friends, this, when Jesus calls us to this, 
This is way more than a call to be nice to that annoying coworker of yours two cubicles over. This is, this is more than being called to have warm, fuzzy feelings for the neighbor whose dog poops in your yard. This is not just about being kind. This is not a call to be polite. Love, as defined and modeled by Jesus, is an active love. This, this pings right on the stuff Brian was teaching us just last week. You want to be greatest in the kingdom of heaven, and he that will be greatest in the kingdom of heaven is the one who serves. Serving is active. It is engaging. It is, I'm actually going to show up and be present. All right, so what do we do? This is, again, not new teaching for us. But what does the Holy Spirit want to do this morning, supernaturally within us, to begin to reframe our thinking, to lead us to a new space where our mind is renewed by the word of God? This truth that Jesus Christ has laid out when he says, look, this is the heart of God, that you love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and you love your neighbor as yourself. This sums up the entirety of God's revelation to humankind. So, four thoughts that I think the Holy Spirit might want to work within us, all right? So two of them are what happens on the inside. One is what we do externally and then, and then kind of the foundational why behind it. And we'll be very, very quick. And this is actually kind of our so what conclusion here, all right? Two things on the inside. First off, we need to drop the preconceived biases about people who are different than us. That's what Jesus was facing You know, if the Pharisees had slowed down long enough to understand the heart of Jesus Christ, they probably would have found they had so much in common. Odds are actually fairly high that in terms of what denomination or sect of Judaism Jesus practiced himself, he probably was, he probably grew up a Pharisee. Like, you know, some of you grew up a Baptist, some of you grew up up Presbyterian. Jesus probably grew up in the the Pharisaical uh, traditions. He wasn't far from that. But they had this bias about him. Because he's introducing ideas that were going to stretch their thinking. And friends, I think when you and I, we look at the, how Jesus Christ um, lived and how he navigated this and what it means for us to love our enemies, to be actively involved with love and presence and service amongst those who our differences are so great we think of them as enemies or they think of us as enemies. The starting point is the bias, right? Our polarized views that we have of one another may in fact be false binaries. That if you think like that, you must, well, maybe not. Humans are complex, right? Frankly, if we sat down with the person who is completely unlike us, this could be true politically, this could be true about your ex, this could be true about your kids from who you feel estranged, this could be true about that coworker that you just really don't like and you think, boy, that person's just viewing the world so much differently than me. This is certainly true of people with different religious views than you. That skeptic, that friend of yours who, who just can't understand why you're crazy enough to go to church, right? Pick the person of difference, but if you honestly sat down and said, let me understand your heart, you may find that we're not that far apart. That there are just certain views and certain angles that have been different. And one of the other things I think we need to recognize, friends, is that our, to remember that the intensity of the bias that we have, particularly as it relates to social things in our culture these days, is being fanned and stoked by the information sources that we have. The media and the political agendas that are, are there and trying to, our, our, our nation is trying to divide us because it sells more news, newspapers and it, it's easier to, to elect an official because he opposes the hate that, you know, that, that supposedly you're trying to break down. So we need to drop those biases. That's an inside thing. Holy Spirit, do this work. Help me to see another person as made in the image of God, as beautiful, as God's beloved, as forgiven. You mean God forgives my ex? Yep, sure does. You mean God, you mean God loves that person who voted for, mm -hmm. he loves them, he is giddy about them? Do you, you mean to tell me that, that guy at work who is so nasty, that Jesus is thinking of him and present with him and loving. Yep, sure is. Second thought, and this one is specific about politics, politically specifically, we need to adopt Jesus' view of the most dysfunctional society in recent millennia. 
tyrannical Rome. Now, let me, let, me, let me explain what I mean by this. I've heard a lot of Christians these days going, how in the world can we stand by and let America be ruined by? And by the way, if you listen long enough, both sides are saying that, right? Um, well, I understand that feeling, and as a proud American who loves the United States, and you know, I'm all you know, patriotic and so forth, but I have to stop and say, wait a minute. If I really want to be like Jesus Christ, if that is my chief aim, is to follow the footsteps of Jesus, what did Jesus do living in one of the most abjectly anti-God societies in human history? How did Jesus handle being under political oppression by a political worldview that was overtly opposed to the things of God? Read it. He never said a word. Never addressed it. Never spoke up about it. He never made a Facebook post. But however they did that back then. <laughs> he simply submitted to the basics, obey the law, pay your taxes, give to Caesar what Caesar's, and then he moved on. He never pushed against them. He never rallied for or against them because here's the point. Here's the point, friends. Oh, and this will set you free if you'll get this, friends. He lived entirely for a different kingdom one that is not of this world. He placed his hope, his actions, his commentary exclusively there. And oh, by the way, look at how he practiced spiritual community. Have you ever noticed, I mean, there's a whole long list of the guys who were the disciples of Jesus, hung out with him, and they went camping for three years together. I mean, this is like some really intimate kind of, you know, bonding, you know, bromance kind of stuff going on here, all the, the 12 disciples. And have you ever noticed that one of them is Levi the tax collector, a Roman official oppressing the Jewish people, and another one, you probably never caught this, Simon the Zealot, remember reading that? Simon the Zealot, the Zealots were completely anti-Rome extremists, right? They were the anti-government, right, right? And Simon the Zealot and... And, and Levi the tax collector, they're hanging out on the same team together, praying together and sharing communion together and casting out demons together and healing the sick together and praying for, wow. That's how Jesus practiced in a profoundly divided society. So, inside, face the preconceived biases, look at how Jesus handled the tyrannical, dysfunctional society he was a part of. So then we do those two things inside, the way we think. Then we're able to do the outward. Here's the outward one. We need to proactively engage those with whom we differ the most with loving and relational presence. This is what Jesus said. Give. Give to the one who asks you. Do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. This is about serving, giving, turning towards, sacrificing, lending to, going the extra mile, this is what Brian talked about last week, serving one another. Serving is active. It's more than polite kindness. It's more than silent tolerance. It is actively engaged. I was trying to think of an example of this, and I don't know, it's, this will probably land with those of you who have strong political feelings. I imagine many of you do. So take your strong political view, the party that you think is the best, right, or the healthiest for our country, and picture yourself going to a political rally held by the other guys, and bring him with you a case of water bottles on ice to hand out. Can you picture a political gathering that is the exact opposite of viewpoint, and you say, hey, can I, you mind if I cater for you guys and bring you food? All, all, all on me. I'll, I'll cook the chicken parmesan, and I won't put anything in it. <laughs> can you imagine that? That's serving. Now, that's an example, a goofy one. But how about in your life, in my life, how about we find that person? And again, this is bigger than politics. This is, this is, keep bringing up your ex. Some of you might need to call your ex and just see how they're doing. Not, not to rekindle something, but just like, hey, I actually care. How's things? Right? Some of you, find that person in your life and think about what would it mean for me to do something for them that's serving and the fourth thought. So first two things are preconceived bias, drop it. Second thing, adopt Jesus' view. Third thing, proactively engage those with whom we differ. And the, and the fourth thing, to recognize this is what authentic spirituality is all about. This is it. 
This is, what it's, this is what Jesus lived. This is what authentic spirituality is. There really isn't anything else. Jesus says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other law. Because all of the law is summed up in this. The behavior that Jesus has called us to be is people of love. And we're able to do so as the Holy Spirit flows through us and empowers us when we yield to his way of thinking. So in just a moment, as Reuben's going to lead us in a space of worship, I want to invite you to, to pray for God the Holy Spirit to reveal to you his agenda in your life specifically. One person or one group of people or two or three people. God, what's the renewing of the mind you want me to have here? We want to pray, God, that you will empower me to be changed. So, Father, in this space right now, we invite your Holy Spirit to work on the inner places of our hearts and our minds. Bring to us, God, where, bring to us revelation where our posture and our position has not been that like Christ in these circumstances. Holy Spirit, we ask you to reveal to us what would it mean to step towards that other person or a step towards that group to build a bridge of compassion, a bridge of activity, a bridge of service, a bridge of relational presence. What would it mean? God, give us an idea of somebody this week we could step towards with authentic, active love. Father, we repent of where we have allowed the circumstances of this past year or two to tighten down our biases, to tighten down our anger, to tighten down our divisiveness. God, we seek your Holy Spirit to release us from that. Make us new as we give you our hearts. In Jesus' name.